Welcome to A Thrivable Life, a podcast that shows how ordinary people can take everyday actions for a thrivable future where everyone lives in harmony with nature. Hi, I'm Kavya, a project manager by profession, and I am interested in learning about the impact we have on the environment and society, and in turn, how we are shaped by it. And hi, Mike. I'm a research assistant at Thrive with a background in political science and social policy. I also have a passion for social and environmental sustainability and biodiversity. And we are from the Thrive Project, the not-for-profit research institute, think tank and advocacy group. Kavya and I will be your co-hosts as we talk with our special guests about how we can create a world that is not just sustainable, but one that thrives. Before we introduce this week's guest, we would like to recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first people of this place now known as Australia, as well as uh, First Nations people across the globe. And today's topic is something our guest is very familiar with. This is sustainable agriculture. We would like to introduce today's guest, Lotlo Delamini. She has a bachelor's degree in physics and agrometeorology. She has worked at a science and technology institution in South Africa. She has completed her master's in business administration at Edinburgh Business School in the United Kingdom and has a special interest in climate change and agriculture. Thank you, Lotlo, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Maybe we could start by just understanding what's the definition of sustainable agriculture. In simple terms, sustainable agriculture means farming to meet uh, the demands for food production without destroying natural resources, land, air, and most importantly, water to irrigate and grow the crops or livestock that you have on your farm. I know you... uh have a background in sustainable agriculture. How did you come about getting involved in this space? Uh, actually, the plan was not to uh, go in agriculture sector. I actually planned to study uh, meteorology, which was mostly influenced by my mom because my, my mom worked at meteorology in Lesotho. But uh, agriculture is something that was always there at home. My dad was a, a teacher, but on the side, he would plant crops. We had uh, a sheep and cows, chickens. We basically farming on the side, and we would sell to the community that we have people passing by our house. They would see we are selling this uh, crops and animals, and then just come and buy. And uh, like I said earlier, the influence was more of what my mom studied. So when I completed my metric, um, I applied University of Pretoria to study meteorology, but then there was challenges with finance because if I had to go out of the town that I'm staying to go and study in another province, um, it will actually be more expensive. So my parents were like, can't you find something similar here at home? Then it's related. And that's when I uh, looked at uh, the university that was in my area. I see that they offer agrometeorology. That's when I was like, ah, it's the same. I, it's the same as studying meteorology and at home, we are doing fun, so I pursued agrometeorology that way. Yeah, sounds like a perfect blend of, you know, what you'd seen all your life and somehow happened uh, very coincidentally. Yes, yeah, it's, it's basically my childhood, everything was, they influence most of my career. What do you see as the need for sustainable agriculture? Like, why do we need it and what's kind of wrong with the ways... Uh, for at least quite some time, it's it's maybe industrially done or it has been followed. I I think a uh, sustainable agriculture, we have to ensure that we keep our we protect our resources. So, commercial farming it's good in a way that it provides uh, food to people, but now it also compromises on sustainability, compromises on uh. uh uh, the environment now we have pollution and using machinery that requires fossil fuels. So, if we can try to at least um, incorporate methods that are more sustainable, providing food, still providing food for people, but 
without impacting the environment. So I think it's important that uh, we we consider those factors, especially for commercial farmers. They are more on the commercial side of using more um, energy consuming uh, machinery. And so uh, it's important they also focus on uh, bringing that sustainability aspect in their farming practices. And you did mention about, I think maybe it is challenging when you look at the way agriculture has been done until now, uh, in the sense that uh, you know commercial agriculture probably uses a lot more resources, and in cases where even, for example, forests are probably uh, being slowly removed uh, to promote certain products which are extremely high in demand. So, in in such a situation of you know extreme high demand and then uh, just the need for food increasing and variety of food increasing, uh, what are the different challenges that somebody who's trying to move into sustainable agriculture would probably face? Um, the challenges that I think I've noticed among farmers is um, lack of knowledge. A lot of farmers are not aware of what sustainable practices are for them to actually begin implementing that in their farming practices. And some of them, once they get the knowledge, now they are faced with a challenge of Funding. How do I now get the money to get these uh, resources that are going to help me to produce enough food for people and uh, help me transition to uh, sustainable agriculture? So those are the challenges. And the other challenges that uh, farmers face uh, when it comes to converting to sustainable agriculture agriculture is the demand. People are now used to uh, conventional way, ways of producing food. So now when a farmer comes and tries to introduce food that are organically produced or um, uh, they didn't use a lot of uh, chemicals, you find that now they are only attract a small percentage of the community. So they're not getting a lot of buyers. So now you find that the farmer is like, I still think I need to produce for me to have a livelihood. I still need to produce my crops the way the, the conventional way. So, and uh, sustainable, sustainably produced um, food are usually more expensive than the the conventional produced food. So people normally opt for that and it's really a challenge for farmers. So um, then those are the main challenges actually with uh, transition to a sustainable agriculture. Yeah, and I think I've also seen, uh, for example, certain organic products sometimes don't look uh, or are not a, sometimes the same size in terms of specific species that work well as a conventionally uh, produced one, which look like they're picture perfect in some sense. And I don't know if that also has, has an impact because I have seen people who might not see a big price difference, but they just don't find it good looking enough to buy uh, sometimes. Um, not sure if that's an experience that you had to. Uh, yes, yes, I can agree with you with that. And also, the other day, I, I I got these wipes that said they were organic, and then I realized I have to use them more than the conventional product. So I thought maybe I would use those less, but now I find myself using more of those products than the other ones. Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, you know, raise as well a question, um, you know, the the fact when we're talking about obviously different organic produce and, and even as you were saying, like, like, like small scale examples of, of like, you know, farming, you know, in a small scale within our local community. But I suppose another factor is, as you were kind of alluding to, with the, the quality of produce is things like efficiency and on that commercial level, the efficiency of produce and meeting meeting demand from the public and you know having enough of um you know having enough resources uh 
you know, products to, to, to feed a population, et cetera, and how that kind of intersects with the, you know, sustainability requirements on that kind of mass scale. Obviously, if you, people can talk about organic farming, but on that sort of mass scale, I think that must be one of the biggest challenges in terms of supplying uh, demand within, you know, populations broadly and how what the, the sustainability approaches are there. So I'm wondering if that's something that could be uh, noted as, as needing more of a, a revision um, and, you know, more of a comprehensive one as opposed to what is often cited, as, as I, I've, I've noticed, where people do talk about uh, they, they might ignore the need for, um, let's say, approaches to preventing deforestation. You know, talk, talk about, say, animal agriculture, for example, and the huge impact that that has on deforestation or water use, etc. But people will then point to small scale examples to kind of say, yeah, but this can be done in a way which is, you know, more sustainable. But obviously, there are huge challenges given the the fact that uh, in order for most uh, supply for most people, uh, there is that. Well, let's say that large-scale commercial need, you know, of of for agricultural, uh, for agriculture. So I'm just wondering what the how how we could uh, address the, those challenges and and how you would see that lot lot low like the distinction between or, or where in the African in the South African context how you would see local or community-based produce. Do, is that possible to? supply populations broadly or is the commercial side needed and therefore needing to be revised in how it's done so it's done uh, sustainably? I think because now there's more people, especially let me uh, speak about South Africa, because more people are now um, in the city. We do need more conventional agriculture to supply uh, food. But if people really stayed in their villages and not move more to the city and i think because what happens in rural areas in villages people plant uh, crops and they have animals and they would either sell those crops to the community so you find that you are feeding the community so now the the farmers the commercial farmers don't have too much pressure on feeding the whole population because now people are also moving away from uh, the villages to the city there's a demand now to feed these people who are in the city who are not planting crops in their garden and all that so that's why i think the the conventional farming has become prominent that way so there are still uh, small farmers, like for instance, for me, I always try to for farmers that I can go to to buy the food directly from them. And now you find the challenge now with them, I think they also saw, okay, people now want naturally grown food and they don't want food that are produced conventional way you find that now the prices are now so high and then you realize when you compare them with the the prices at the supermarket you realize wow i'm paying twice as much to get this natural grown chicken or sheep and that also discourages one to actually um support those small farmers who are producing sustainably grown chickens and other livestock. Yeah, I'm just wondering, yeah, and to the the you know, the I suppose the reality faced with the world at the moment is the factor of, you know, our population growth and huge you know, we've got what over eight billion people on the planet now. And I suppose that comes into it as well that uh, like historically, you know, thousands of years, you know, we've been able to live within sustainable parameters, obviously, but uh, with that population growth and supply of food products to to the population, there's obviously has to be some attempt at, uh, because of the huge scale of agriculture required, that it has to have that revised approach. And I think obviously, yeah, so I suppose um, population is probably a big part of it. As you said, so many people are living in cities, but 
that too is, um, you know, just our human existence is generally has a big encroaching impact on the on the natural world. Yes. Yeah. On the demand side, I think that's one of the biggest challenges is having a market that's accepting organic, uh, you know, food and also just given standard of living uh, and just struggles with a bunch of crises we've had in the past, I would say three to four years. There is a, you know, cost attached to it, but there are other challenges as well that we spoke about for farmers. Uh, are there any solutions, uh, maybe technological solutions that are actually helping organic and sustainable practices going forward? Uh, are there any examples that you want to share with us? Well, actually for commercial, even for sustainable farmers, um, I think now the newest technologies that farmers are using now is uh, precision agriculture, where farmers are now using drones and sensory devices to actually detect pests, checking whether the crops, uh, the field, it has water or it's dry, so it helps them um, improve their farming practices. So those that, that is one of the technologies that I'm seeing happening, as well as also, artificial intelligence is is really gaining uh, a lot of momentum in the agricultural sector. Farmers are using it to get early warnings of severe weather conditions. Like these days, we are having heat waves, and uh, most farmers are complaining that their crops are drying out. So, uh, artificial intelligence can help farmers with um, detecting severe weather conditions like droughts and floods, which normally are some of the factors that uh, influence farmers' production. And artificial intelligence, they can also determine the moisture content in the soil of the crops that they have planted, uh, whether there is enough water or less water. So it improves the improves the farmer's irrigation system. So the farmer will end up implementing smart irrigation systems that will let him know when to irrigate and when not to irrigate. So in that way, they are conserving water. So you use water based on what the crop requires. So those are some of the technologies that are actually improving the agriculture sector. Yeah, I think I think that's great that that there are ways technology can uh, help, especially uh, today with digital technology moving at the pace that it is. Um, and are there any actual practices that the farmers do which which have changed uh, from a day to day perspective in the pursuit of being more sustainable? Uh, on one hand, like you said, is the use of technology to get certain data uh, or what existence. Uh, but what have they probably changed uh, in how they do farming? Yes, there are other farming practices that uh, promote sustainable agricultures, which uh, requires farmers to use less uh, machinery, less energy. And these are, um, for example, no-till practices, no-tillage. So farming, you find that uh, in conventional farming, a farmer would use fossil fuel powered um, vehicles to actually prepare the soil for planting. But no tillage, you don't have to use um, fossil fuel consumption machinery. You just plant uh, the, the crops directly on the soil without having to alter or disturb the soil. So no tillage is actually one of uh, the sustainable methods that some farmers are using to eliminate um, energy use. And there's also crop rotation. Farmers, they basically plant crops uh, not at the same area or piece of land 
consecutively every year. So find that way you have where, where the land where you initially planted uh, spinach, for example, you now change and plant like uh, butternut, watermelon. So it also helps retain the um, soil health and not really affect the composition and the structure of the soil. Maybe while while you're at uh, talking about practices, um, we can um, mention how does having local products or market have any impact? Definitely, yes. Local products are actually good because you find that it takes a shorter time for to deliver these foods to the stores, to the retailers. So it takes quite a shorter time and the foods are fresher and it becomes less expensive. Local agriculture supporting it's actually uh, very sustainable. And in some cases, if you buy directly to the farmer, you actually eliminate having to, the farmer having to now package um, his uh her product so yeah, i think even my uh, my dad calls he also uh, uh supplies to one of the local stores egg home they don't use packaging like you see in big retail stores you just you just you know fasten it with a rubber band and <laughs> it's done it just saves a lot on uh, packaging material yeah, that's predominantly plastic in, in most places. It's it's quite insane, for example, when you see a banana wrapped in a plastic, which makes absolutely no sense, uh, no matter where I think it comes from. And I think one of the other impacts, is, I think we see that in terms of local products, um, correct me if I'm wrong, are there specific crops or, you know, way of farming that uh, promotes uh, more sustainable agriculture? Yeah, it's really uh, dependent on whether the crop can sustain the type of weather conditions. So farmers normally, uh, they look at weather patterns and when they plan for farming in the next year, they see, okay, this year I might not, I don't think I should plant or some in some cases they don't know what the weather is gonna be like. So but some of them have knowledge about how to mitigate on these severe weather conditions. So crops like maize, where I come from in the free state, they can uh, tolerate uh drought, they can tolerate heat. Heat waves is a big thing in South Africa these days. And sunflower, it's also one of the crops that um, can tolerate great drought and heat. And there's other crops in other parts of the world, like wheat. I think even in Lesotho, wheat and beans, they do well in those conditions. So, and um, yes, and uh, like I said earlier, farming, systems like crop, crop rotation helps because if you are planting the same uh, crop every year it, but you might find that uh, it's not going to survive on this year's weather conditions so when you rotate your crops and not plant the same thing the crop might do well and farmers can also try to farm other crops that they haven't farmed before because you don't know how they would do in the type of soil your your farm is or the type of weather that uh, will be there. Yes. Yeah. I just wanted to briefly add to that, and I'm, I just wanted to yeah briefly add. I'm not I'm certainly not an expert in, in agricultural sustainability, but yeah, one that one interesting innovation I'm aware of as Lotlo was mentioning about new crops was uh, or new you know approaches was the um, phenomena, recent phenomena of seaweed farming and just seeing how that has an extraordinary uh, potential at least because there isn't that requirement for fertiliser or water use you know, for it to grow and it does uh, have many uses including to supplement plastic 
you know, bags, or, you know, it can, it can be a plastic use as well as food, a food source uh, for, for different additives as well as protein, but also um, it is a huge um, carbon, you know, source of uh, carbon sequestration. So it's really, it's good for climate, the climate and mitigating climate change as well. So that's probably another just a little interesting point, I thought, to, to mention that um, going forward, you wonder to what extent that will be uh, embraced, given that it has a completely different uh, sort of output and um, way of being produced that, than, than most traditional agriculture, obviously on land anyway. Yeah, yeah. And I think, think yeah, beyond land agriculture, there's also other, other things that we could probably grow. What is needed uh, to promote sustainable agriculture? For me, what I think uh, consumers can do really to contribute to sustainable agriculture, firstly, they should um, focus on eating what is in season, buying what is in season. That way, we do not put too much pressure on the resources. In fact, we do not put too much pressure on farmers to produce uh, crops that are not in season. And that also helps the farmer to not put too much pressures on the resources because now they have to produce crops that are not in season because people now want. If people can just eat what is in season and rotate crops like that, I think it will contribute to sustainable agriculture and we won't have to put too much pressure on our resources. Yeah, and I'll probably just yeah mention um, obviously being just being the consumer to be aware of of you know the the impact that um, some some agriculture can have on the ecosystem broadly, and um, yeah to try and yeah, choose sustainably. Obviously, plant based approaches is helpful, but yeah to choose uh, sustainably broadly, just to be aware of things like water use as well. Yeah, and as well as particular particular businesses which might not be sustainable um, in their in their uh, operations as well. Yeah, and I think it, just education broadly is not just for farmers, it's also for, for consumers a lot of times, like Leclerc was saying. Um, and I think we could also probably focus on the fact that there needs to be probably policies and just general promotion, uh, something that people from all walks of life can kind of come together and try and... Uh, make a push in their local governments and their local uh, agencies as well to ensure that there is some kind of policy and incentives that might help farmers really uh, focus on sustainable farming without losing you know, their source of revenue. Yes, most definitely. Yeah, and I think it's also important, I remember a study particularly showing how incentivizing uh, farmers and, and having uh, proper yeah, policy guidance by governments for for uh, you know, moving towards more sustainable farming, and particularly where it's particularly uh, the, the current practices might be particularly bad, but there does need to be leadership from governments and less um, sort of governments adhering to uh, short-term economic profits or you know uh, GDP short-term benefits, and looking more to the future of sustainability and, and guiding both farmers and and consumers alike in, in that way. And and the people uh, people yeah, within the community, yeah, the consumers, putting pressure on governments uh, to do so and to look at what is sustainable farming and what isn't and to put pressure on governments to lead in that way to, to make it easy, easier for that transition. Yes. Thank you so much. I definitely learned a lot. And thanks to Tlotlo and Michael for for talking uh, together for, for this much time on this topic. Thank you for having me.